As we move into our third year here on WTBS, we've dramatically revamped our facilities to better serve you, our audience. To celebrate the occasion, Benny Parsons, the most recent Grand National Stock Car Race winner, has joined us today, and he'll answer a $175,000 question. From Shreveport, Louisiana, we'll talk with beaten and battered world motorcycle champ, Freddie Spencer. And, of course, we have abundant race highlights. The look is new. The service will be better. But our objective remains the same. We're here each Saturday to bring you all the news of worldwide motorsports. The news today ranges from Formula One road racing to stock cars, from American and world endurance competition to Mexican off-roading. But the story breaking right now is IndyCars. The $10 million CART PPG IndyCar World Series opens tomorrow. Helen, what's happening right now in Long Beach, California? Dave, Colombian Roberto Guerrero, an ex-Formula One driver, has shocked the IndyCar establishment by taking the provisional pole in Friday qualifying. Guerrero, an IndyCar rookie, is joined on the front row by another Formula One cast-off, Bruno Giacomelli. The second row is made up of sons of former world champions. Michael Andretti is third, Jeff Brabham fourth. Mario Andretti will start right behind his oldest son, while his younger son Jeff and nephew John will race in preliminary events. That makes four Andrettis taking part in the Long Beach weekend. Final grid positions will be set after today's final qualifying session going on right now. Well, of course, a big part of the Long Beach story is the fact that Indy cars have replaced Formula One road racers in the California streets. The skyrocketing cost of World Championship Grand Prix forced the Long Beach promoters to find an alternative. Nonetheless, Formula One is alive and well. Last Sunday in Brazil, 26 of the world's most exotic cars rolled to the starting grid for the opening of their 84 season. 115 degree temperatures took a toll on that field. Brazilian world champ Nelson Piquet looks calm and cool, but former champ Nicky Lauda and his European counterpart suffered in the equatorial heat. On the pole, a surprise, Elio De Angelis and his new Lotus. At the start, a disappointment for the home fans. Nelson Piquet stalls in mid-pack. The rush to turn one, led by Michele Alvaretto. He's new to the Ferrari team, and he wasted no time pulling out a huge lead while the Brazilian race marshals tried to help Piquet. As Alvaretto put a second a lap on the field, attention focused on the orange and white McLaren of Nicky Lauda. He took second from pole sitter De Angelis. Then his teammate Elaine Prost followed him through traffic. He was headed for the front. Alvaretto's apparent heyday turned sour just short of halfway. The sweltering heat got to his brakes. That gave Lauda the lead. Prost zapped Derek Warwick for second, and suddenly Porsche engines ran one, two. Well, the heat really got to Rennie Arnoux, one of six retirees to blown motors. Lap 34 of 61, things get busy in the McLaren pits. Pro stop routine, but Lauda climbed out. The engine sour. Late in the race, mileage becomes the issue. Fuel conscious K.K. Rosberg moves to second. Challengers like Patrick Tambay out of gas. Ironically, Prost tanks ran dry as he crossed the line, giving Porsche only its second Grand Prix win in history. Only eight of 26 cars finished. While that Porsche engine was scoring its landmark victory in Brazil, Porsche officials issued a blockbuster announcement in Germany. We'll have that story a little later. And we'll be right back for an exclusive interview with world motorcycle champ Freddie Spencer on a horrendous crash in South Africa and rough and tumble supercross action from the Houston Astrodome. World Championship Series opened last weekend in South Africa without the world champion. Freddie Spencer, Motor Week's 83 Champion Spark Plug Racer of the Year, scratched from the South African Grand Prix after a hard practice crash. He'll tell us about that in a moment. First, the race highlights. Crashes and rain, the story. Everybody walked away from this pileup at the start of the 250cc race. Frenchman Hervé Goulet led till he took this tumble into the bales. His countryman Patrick Fernandez, there's a good French name, took the win. The lone American Wayne Rainey, eight. 500 class, that's the one that counts. Eddie Lawson isn't afraid of a little shower. The one-time American dirt tracker went from 12th to 1st before the first turn. But from out of the downpour, are you ready for this? Didier Diradi. Now there's a French name. Lawson quickly repassed Diradi. Under these treacherous conditions, courage is the key issue. And Eddie's got a bundle of that. Now watch Raymond Roche testing the limit as Ron Haslam, teammate of the absent Freddie Spencer, charges into second. Haslam rode brilliantly, but 
He too reached out, looking for the edge, found it, and tumbled right off of it. He quickly got to his feet, but his day was done. Mercifully, the rain and the carnage stopped in the late laps of this race, and Californian Eddie Lawson streaked home on a still wet racetrack, claiming his first Grand Prix victory. The indomitable Barry Sheen, hurt so badly two years ago, proved he is still a racer. The obvious next question, how is the champion? Team Honda's Freddie Spencer had a harrowing experience in South Africa. In a 70 mile per hour turn, the high technology carbon fiber rear wheel on his motorcycle disintegrated. His injuries, painful but not severe. Earlier, I talked to Freddie and asked him about the crash. It didn't feel too good. In fact, I was, I was kidding to somebody about that it felt like that I was walking through an alley and about 10 guys jumped on me and, and I hurt all over, but um, yeah, that's how much of a shock it was. I didn't expect it to happen. And uh, fortunately, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been worse. You guys race at 170 miles an hour as well as 70 miles an hour. You constantly push your own ability, but you also test the limits of motorcycle technology. I'm wondering after this experience, how you feel about the use of carbon fiber in your bike? I don't know that much about the material, and I'm certainly not an expert, but from what, just what I know about it, um, I do think there is places for it. Um, on a car or a motorcycle, but um, the wheel, uh, I don't think is the place that, uh, that obviously it can, it can function. Freddie, you tell me you feel pretty well. Can you really be ready for the next Grand Prix? Um, I really do feel that in two weeks, when in the Italian Grand Prix, when they start official qualifying, that uh, I'll be back to 100%. Well, Freddie also told me that even though Eddie Lawson rides for the rival Yamaha factory, he was happy that his fellow American won the race. Freddie says he likes to hear the national anthem. Now a couple quick Wrangler Supercross motorcycle highlights from the Houston Astrodome. Watch Don Turk in the last chance qualifier. He's going for one remaining slot in the main event. He's got a great start, leads the charge to turn one. Oh, but he forgot to turn. Miller time comes early. In the main event, David Bailey, defending series champ, scored an easy win and capped it, as always, with his Look Ma No Hands trademark. David's been practicing that move lately. He's won three major races in the last four weeks. Now say hello to Winston Cup Stock Car Racing's Benny Parsons. Benny, it was nice to see you back in Victory Lane at Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. Dave, it was nice to be back in Victory Lane. It was September 1981 when I won my last race. Uh, but the best thing was this was the first victory for Johnny Hayes, Leo Jackson, and all my Copenhagen crew, their very first trip to Victory Lane. Well, that crew, of course, helped Benny set a modern-day Winston Cup record. Nine different race winners in a row since last October. Darrell Waltrip started the string at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Then Richard Petty scored at Charlotte, North Carolina with an illegal engine. Recall, he gave back the prize money, but he kept the win. Texan Terry Labonte ran the streak to three at Rockingham, North Carolina. Neil Bonnet kept the ball rolling at Atlanta International Raceway. The 83 series finale in Riverside made it five for five. Benny, you let my North Georgia neighbor Bill Elliott get the best of you. Dave, I keep seeing this same shot. All, all winter I just kept seeing the same shot and he beat me every time. I like that part where you ran into him. New season, Cale Yarborough wins Daytona. The streak goes to six and a week later seven as Ricky Rudd roars at Richmond, Virginia. Bobby Allison's conquest at Rockingham ties the different winner mark and here sits the man who set the record, the ninth different winner in a row, Benny Parsons. Now that's a remarkable string, and in a moment we'll talk about how long it can continue, and Benny will explain why winning Atlanta forced him to make a $175,000 decision. Winner and former Grand National Stock Car Champion Benny Parsons, who recently scored a great victory. Benny, you muscled around Dale Earnhardt and showed your tail to Cale Yarborough and went on to a magnificent Sunday afternoon drive, winning the Coca-Cola 500. Not bad at all for a guy who races part-time and has a lot of other business interests, but that win forced you to make a tough decision. Tell me about that. Well, Dave, NASCAR has a program called Winner's Circle, and if you agree to run 30 races, you're assured between six and $7,000 appearance money. So that's about $175,000 total for the year, but there are some problems with that. Well, the problem is that we decided last fall to run 16 races this year. For us to change our mind with two weeks notice, I think would ruin our whole season. 
I got to think that $175,000 would change a lot of minds. Well, that's a lot of money. I'm not uh, belittling $175,000, but we're going to spend between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 every race we go to. So, what's the bottom line economic answer here? What's the $175,000 answer? No, we're not going to take their money. I see. Well, you couldn't run all the races anyway because then you couldn't be a television pit reporter, right? Well, that's right, and I'm going to work with you guys May the 12th at Nashville, and I'm looking forward to working again with the WTBS crew. Before you get away, I want to talk a moment about tomorrow's Winston Cup race up at Bristol, Tennessee. Darrell Waltrip has won six straight Bristol races. Tomorrow he can tie the record for consecutive wins at one track, and he can end that record streak of different winners that we just talked about. I'm wondering if you think he can do it. Well, there's no doubt he can do it. Six in a row? Sure. Why can't he do seven in a row? The best thing he's got going for him is Junior Johnson's car because that car in his hands or Kel Yarborough's hands has been the dominant car for 12 years. Well, we'll have the answer next week here on Motor Week. Benny, thanks so much for being with us today, and good luck at Darlington on April the 15th. Now let's see the end of a 14-year losing streak. That's how long Iron Man Jack Ingram, late model sportsman, stock car legend, has been trying to win a race at Martinsville, Virginia. Sam R. dominates this track and led again Sunday until he started having trouble and a philosophical number 11 Ingram went to the front. Martinsville, I haven't been able to win, but I told uh, a reporter the day before yesterday that if I never won a race at Martinsville, and I felt like that when I hung it up, that I'd done about everything that you could do. But I still wanted to win. Ingram got that long-awaited win last Sunday. Two lengths in front of Dale Jarrett and Iron Man didn't have much use for the theory that Ard would have won if he hadn't had trouble. Uh, if you all want to say that he won the race, just have at it. Sam Ard did not win this race. And in my opinion, he didn't have no more problems than I've been having here for the last 14 years. The modified race at Martinsville rained out Sunday. It's been rescheduled for April 28th as part of their Grand National Weekend. Rusty Wallace is the American Speed Association stock car champion. Last weekend, he beat Winston Cup regular Jody Ridley to take the all-pro stock car series opener. Now let's go to an endurance road racing upset. Sebring, Florida hosted its 32nd annual 12-hour Camel GT Marathon last weekend. Our Jim Roller watched as the front runners went to the showers. The first Sebring favorite to fall by the wayside was the blue double zero march that won the 24 hours of Daytona. Close behind were two Jaguar prototypes. Doc Bundy lost the series point lead when number 44 dropped out in the late evening. The Sebring airport circuit gets rougher with age. Only 33 of 81 starters finished and most of them experienced some sort of unplanned adversity. Included in that list a team that's quickly becoming a soap opera. A.J. Foyt, Bob Wallach, and Derek Bell were running away with the race and their Porsche in the late afternoon. Wallach and Foyt, you'll recall, had harsh words en route to last year's 24 Hours of Daytona win. This year at Daytona, Bell was recruited from the WTBS broadcast booth to drive the night shift, and the team finished second. After a bit of debate at Sebring, Wallach was tapped to drive at night. He's the youngest of the trio. Presumably, he has the best eyesight. But Wallach promptly drove off the track at dusk squandering a three-lap lead. Proving there's no hard feelings left over from that Daytona episode, Foyt pitched in to replace the suspension. The team eventually finished third. With that, the Porsche 935 of Mauricio De Narvez, Hans Hare, and Sweden's Stefan Johansson moved on to the lead lap. This amazing car was in a German museum 10 days before the race. De Narvez convinced its owner, Reinhold Joost, to recommission what became the 107th and last Sebring entry. The museum piece was chasing the new leader, Bob Aiken, number five, Sebring's hard luck driver. The 1979 winner leads this race year after year only to break down in the late stages. This year, the culprit was a broken hub. That cost Aiken and teammates John Osteen and Hans Stuck any chance at victory. Following Aiken to the exit was Randy Lanier, who performed this impromptu nose job on his march. He wouldn't win either. And suddenly, Denarvez, Hare, and the youngster Johansson had their Porsche literally pulled from a museum showcase all alone out front. That's Denarvez's first win in nine tries at Sebring. Foyt, Wallach, and Bell, they never left the top five, even despite their trouble. This is Jim Roller reporting from Sebring. I think the happiest man in Florida last weekend was Reinhold Yost. He owns that Porsche, brought it out of the museum, brought it to Florida, and won the race. For that, he gets our U.S. Air Force Reserve Wrangler Behind the Scenes Award. 
Reinhold is now in the running for a VT500 Ascot motorcycle that goes to our year-end behind-the-scenes award winner. We also have a 750 Interceptor for our Racer of the Year. Now, on paper, Doc Bundy is the odds-on to regain the Camel GT point lead next Sunday at Road Atlanta. Why? Because he used to teach a race driving school there. Doc will join me here next Saturday to talk about his home track advantage. Finally, a quick look at the Sebring Champion Spark Plug Challenge. The Archer brothers about one light year ahead of the rest of the field. Tommy beat Bobby by half a second. Is the biggest endurance road race in the world. This week, a stunning announcement. The Porsche factory team, undefeated at Le Mans since the present World Championship Series was established, will boycott the 1984 running of the French Classic. Recall our story three weeks ago. Under pressure from Le Mans race officials, the endurance racing bureaucracy, headed by Frenchman Jean-Marie Belleste, changed the World Championship regulations, virtually copying the American Camel GT rulebook. The Porsche people who spent a lot of money building cars to the old specifications are outraged. A Porsche official who asked to remain anonymous told us this week, and we quote, this will show Belast that Porsche is not a yo-yo that he can play with, unquote. Now, there was a big rumor in Europe this week that Lancia would join in the Porsche boycott. That's not true. The Lancia team will compete at Le Mans. We should note that the Porsche factory will contest all of the other World Endurance Championship races. Well, the Porsche factory won't go to Le Mans, but A.J. Foyt will for the first time since 1967 when he and Dan Gurney won the race. The kicker, car owner Preston Hen is trying to get Gurney out of retirement to go too. For a 49-year-old racer, A.J.'s busy. Last week, we surmised that he has a deal with, quote, Chevrolet to develop a competitive V6 turbo engine for the Indy 500. This week, A.J. tells us we were right. <laughs> well, actually, we are going to run one car to be powered by a Chevrolet engine, and the other two new uh, marches will be powered by Cosworth, and I hope to do some testing within a week or two with both, all three cars. A.J., can a stock block V6 really be competitive at Indy? Well, I don't know. After I run some tests, I could say more about it. You know, uh, if it looks that good, I might have one in my car. I'd like to see that. Now, some of us thought the 84 Indy car rules would make those stock block engines uncompetitive against the dominant Ford Cosworth V8s, but Helen, the V6 got a real shot in the arm this week. It was a 200 mile per hour shot in the arm, Dave. In fact, young Scott Brayton, testing his Buick V6 power plant in Indianapolis this week, did a lap at 204. Brayton has a new March chassis and apparently all the horsepower he can use. Brayton's effort marked the first 200 mile per hour lap ever run by a stock block. I think it's going to be an all around good engine and this is our year to uh, more or less approve the engine, develop it, make it stronger and better and uh, there are some, some pieces in it that can be built to make it, you know, uh, a better engine and it's a configuration that's basically bought in every uh, Buick car today. In Bristol, Tennessee, meanwhile, Ricky Rudd has put his Ford Thunderbird on the pole for tomorrow's 500-lap Winston Cup event. He's the fifth different pole sitter in the season's first five races. Terry Labonte, the Grand National Series point leader, will start alongside Rudd in the first row. Darrell Waltrip was third fastest. Waltrip, you remember, is trying to win his seventh straight race at Bristol. In off-road racing, the father-son team of Corky and Scott McMillan won the San Felipe 250 in Mexico last weekend in a Porsche-powered buggy. Driver Jack McCoy, twice Winston West stock car champ, crashed in his Ford Ranchero. His passenger, Stan McCuskey, died in that mishap. McCoy suffered serious injuries. Kenny Roberts, three times world motorcycle road racing champion, retired from Grand Prix racing at the end of last season. Before he quit, Kenny trained a worthy successor. Number 21, Eddie Lawson, no longer the second man, has followed his mentor around a lot of tracks. You always learn when you follow someone like Kenny. Uh, you can't help but, but learn. So uh, I think I can go on and uh, just use what he's taught me, and I, I think uh, I'll be all right. I'll say Lawson is all right. Last Saturday, he won the season-opening South African Motorcycle Grand Prix. Eddie Lawson is our champion spark plug racer of the week, and I think he's a legitimate contender for the world championship. And Helen, with that, we're about out of time. Let's take a quick look ahead to next Saturday. 
Take your last look, Dave, at Formula One cars at Long Beach. Next week's Grand Prix highlights will feature Indy cars. We'll look in as Daryl Waltrip goes after that record-tying seventh straight Bristol, Tennessee stock car victory. Jerry Garrett brings us a special report on one of motorsports' more unusual happenings. And we'll have a lot more racing news and action next Saturday at this time. And finally today, some people will do anything to get on television. Our senior editor, Steve Potter, is a racer. There's Steve at Sebring, on fire, right in front of our camera. That's convenient. Like a good journalist, Steve kept his head. He bailed out of the smoke, grabbed a microphone, and filed a terse but comprehensive report. We had a pretty fair little fire going there for a while. <laughs> That's our boy Steve. On that note, we'll say goodbye. Hope you like our new look and that you'll join us again next Saturday at this same time. For Helen Casey and all of us here at Motor Week, I'm Dave Despain. See you next Saturday.